Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering, live from Accelerate 2018. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, we have special guests fresh off of their main stage presentation. Yeah, I, I imagine there's a lot of adrenaline at this point, I'm, I'm thinking, and not from you or I, but... Not from us, and they're no. not excited to be here. Well... That's mean. We'll see. We have both Denise Schindler and Paul Sohi. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So you guys did a great job this morning at the main stage presentation. Before we get started with digging into what you do and everything you talked about earlier, we have a couple of, I guess, fun icebreaker questions to try and make us friends. What well, do you I, think? I think we use it to determine if we would be <laughs> friends. Like, like right now, we kind of have to pretend, but it's like, would we really be friends is what these handful of questions decide. So think about your answers. You can both give answers. Who's your favorite designer, engineer, or kind of science guy out there in Living, the world? Living, dead, doesn't make a difference. Paul Solhi. Oh, oh <laughs> beautiful. Okay, I already no, don't like you, Denise. Yep, minus one. <laughs> that's fair, guys. Um, man, that's a hard one. I would, I'm going to say Nikola Tesla. Oh, I love that. Yeah, Croatian that sensation. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> beautiful. How many people say that? Like everyone? Or? It's not <laughs> uncommon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's kind of like just far enough off the map that people are like, oh, yeah, it's cool to say that one, right? And, and you don't want to change your answer from Paul? I would. No, it's okay. Paul. Okay, okay, we'll leave My it as Paul. I'm doubt about that. <laughs> okay, okay. If you weren't doing your job that you're currently doing, money wasn't an issue, what would that job be? And don't say, like, I love my job, so it's what I would do. Yeah, you're not allowed Though to do that. Though maybe you actually would say that. <laughs> yeah, my answer would be being a cyclist. So that's my passion. That's what I love. Uh, so. okay. Fair enough. We'll give you a pass, Paul. Yeah. You have to give a different answer than I love my job. Right. <laughs> we know better. So I do love my job. But uh, dream job, if money was no object, I would love to design buildings for video games. Just like crazy, like don't have to worry about physics, doesn't have to work, just looks epic. You're just okay. like Minecrafting stuff all over the place. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Maybe a little more detail. <laughs> all right. In your mind, is Pluto a planet? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes? All okay. right. Well, that's, that's a nod to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Did you know, fun fact, he's the reason why Pluto is not a planet anymore? Neil, well, we be beefing now. Okay. We be beefing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay, next one up. Uh, most influential civilization or technology? You want to go first? Car. That's a good one. Car? The car is... Really? All right. How wow. Would you, how would you have <laughs> he's gotten, very critical. <laughs> Has he been critical this whole time? It's just because... Normally, it's my job, but he's doing now. <laughs> Cheeky. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with Roman Empire. Okay. okay, that's a good one. Last one, you want to take it, Luke? Uh, last one. So you have to rank these in order, and if we missed one. Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, Doctor Who, Star Wars. One, two, three, four. <laughs> what did we miss? Just say them in the order you like them. I'm out. I'm not uh, <laughs> watching movies. My guess is you don't, you, she like I just know Harry she Potter like and Game of Thrones. <laughs> so Game of Thrones just from advertising. I've actually never watched Game of Thrones, so yeah. I'm going to go Star Wars, okay. um, original trilogy only. Uh, what were the other ones? <laughs> uh, Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, and Doctor Who. Oh, Doctor Who, Harry Potter, and then Game of Thrones, because okay. I've not watched it. Okay, that works. Fair enough. I'm assuming we would still be friends with both of them. <laughs> we'll say yes. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how the rest of this goes. All right, so moving on to a little bit of why we're actually here. How about that? We see that you have a Wikipedia page, all of your own. So congratulations. You kind of made it in life. I think that's <laughs> that's kind of what determines if you're do you, somebody. Do you have a Wikipedia page, Paul? I might make one now. <laughs> you make your own. Make, <laughs> make your my own, own one. Update it yourself. I would be interested in who did it because... But I didn't did it. You're not involved did, in did that at all? Did you know you had one before we told you right I know, now? I know, I know, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's really, it's crazy if you go on Wikipedia one time and you see yourself there, yeah. That's pretty awesome. So how many races have you been in over the years and how many do you think you've placed in? That's a hard question. Well, I guess <laughs> I've been racing, now. I'm racing for seven years. Well, I guess I did like 100 races or something okay. like more. 
and it been placing most of the time is pretty good so i have like the metals are not like placed pretty obviously in my apartment so there if you open the cupboard and there are a lot of metals in <laughs> so i can't tell you it's a lot a lot so, so you're doing pretty well yeah how, and like so 2018 is coming to an end or you're on the off season right yeah. so how did 2018 go for you 2018 was just incredible awesome a great year yeah it started with uh, the world championships in the beginning in brazil and rio de janeiro on the track um, been able to become world champion again which was really fulfilling my dreams because i missed it at rio paralympic games so getting back what i missed there was really for me a huge accomplishment and the whole season was just incredible being four times vice pre uh, vice world champion and then ending uh, in canada with the last world cup race with a gold medal so i can't complain Awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's pretty good. So, so when you, you say the track, this is the short track that, that you're speaking of. So this this is the sprints, correct? Um, but I'm focusing more on the long distance and, okay. and the velodrome. So my favorite discipline is the pursuit, okay. which is 3K. Okay. And that's where there's a lot of strategy, correct, with making sure. It, it's not just riding as fast as you can, obviously. It's strategy, yeah, and you shouldn't miss it. Yeah. I, I've seen it before, but I, I, I don't know if I've had the patience to watch the whole thing. So, But now I will. Yeah, it's basically, it's like dying in 12 laps. So yeah. <laughs> you it's can it's decide it's dying really in the first problem. four, really, yeah, really in the last eight. So it's, <laughs> it's really, it's tough. It's a hard race. That's awesome. So how many miles or kilometers, yeah. is that a thing, yeah. do you usually ride a day? Well, a day is hard to say. It always depends on what I have on my, on my training plan. But I can say approximately in the year, I do uh, around 12 to 15,000 mm -hmm. kilometers. I don't know if I drive that far in a car. I know. That's so many. <laughs> that's so many. Paul, how many do you do in a year? Miles on a bicycle? Or kilometers, whatever or makes kilo. you feel better. Thank you. Base 10, guys. Get into it. It's, yeah, it's my bad. Solid. Uh, <laughs> on a bicycle, zero. Because last year I bought and <laughs> bought and had four bikes stolen. Um, I'm not kidding. In Boston or in, in London? In London. Uh. But maybe it was 5K then. So in total, so, yeah, four bikes, all got stoned, one kilometers until it got stoned. <laughs> yeah. 5K? 5K is impressive. In the year. Yeah. That's pretty good. Likely 5K more than I did. So that's still <laughs> something. I'm so, so you said you have only been racing for, for seven years. So were you an athlete prior to that? Uh, or was it really just the cycling that got you into uh, athletics? It was cycling, really, but um, I came to sport very, very late. Okay. Um, when I was a kid, um, like I was wasn't really in touch with sport, and it was not a positive thing I I experienced because when you are amputated um, and you have a normal leg, it's not really working that you exercise and you participate in a regular sports class uh, without pain or really having fun in that, okay. you know, you're always the last. So the turning point was when I started working out in the gym and I started to participate in spinning classes. Okay. So because these bikes were fixed, you know, on the ground, so nobody could like pass me and be faster than mm -hmm. me. So I was able to gain some kind of fitness first and then I started cycling outside. So it's a, I think, a very funny uh, story of a professional athlete. Started with spin. James did a spin class once. Yeah. I, I did and, a spin and, class. And Maybe your career is still open. I, I think I come. have a chance. Uh, 36 is probably the age that people really start yeah. getting into their Absolutely, groove. Absolutely, yeah. You're yeah. in your peak, peak years, man. <laughs> yes. there, there are senior world championships as well. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> she just called you a senior. Oh my goodness. Wow. So certainly not going to be friends, but okay. okay. I see how this I'm, is going. <laughs> I missed it now. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh. So, that. so you were you just came off main stage and and you gave us a, a a description of like the old way that the the prosthetics were made. Could you just give us a short kind of recap of how that goes for the folks listening online? Yeah, you have to know, like, in the old way of how prosthesis are manufactured, you start basically, the other technician starts with a plastic cast, he's taking off my limb, and, and with the plastic cast, he is able to proceed and to produce a prosthesis. That means, like, he's making a testing socket, I get the testing socket, and I give him feedback regularly, which takes, like, three weeks, four weeks, and then he's making adjustments all the time with basically a professional hair dryer. So okay. in the testing socket with... Uh, the heat he's able to um, adjust um, the pressure points and then 
after one month I'm able to um, give him a feedback okay it's fine it's done everything is fine for the socket and he's making the final one out of carbon okay so this is the process very shortly said um, that we have now now from from the 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 socket to the carbon fiber what's that process look like from the the mold they're making is that mm -hmm. a, a quick process an easy process is that something that you're involved in or is that just the the prosthetics like is there ever any fit and finish issues with the carbon fiber model when that happens um the fitting is with the testing socket so okay. when he does um the carbon fiber one and the last version um i'm out so okay. he does have the testing socket which fits and he takes the negative and makes the okay. uh, the carbon one but i'm completely involved in the whole plaster cast because i have to be bare to be there locally i'm involved in giving feedback all the time being there locally to adjust it all the time so it's a long process yeah okay and uh, how many times would you say you've had to go through that fitting process <sighs> it depends a bit but two three times okay because i would imagine that once you get a good fit it, it probably stays for a while it, or, or you think oh, I, I would sure. think that's different i think <laughs> well, it would change it, a lot yeah. If it has to be that precise so that you're not getting pain and yeah, pressure. Yeah, I agree. So if you have um, the socket and you're in for one hour, most of the time it fits. But if you have a whole day and it. all the changes, like um, it's warm outside, you sweat more, the volume decreases um, of your limb. So you have all the changes. So you really have to test it properly okay. that you really 100% that it's fine for every day. Gotcha. I saw that you were stuck working with Mickey Wakefield and of course Paul over here. I'm so sorry. so we gave you a tough group. So that <laughs> I, I don't really have a question. I just kind of wanted to apologize. But <laughs> how large Thank you. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. How large do, of a, an Autodesk team do you think was working on this? Like how many people did you encounter? Well, I don't know all in person, honestly, because um, th the guys took a lot of work away from me that I was able to train a lot. Um, but yeah, I think we've been involving a lot of experts. So the Autodesk team, just in Munich was two, three people. Then we had uh, San Francisco with the printing. Mm -hmm. We had Paul at that time based in London, now somewhere else. So. <laughs> Not that you're I guess better. like you could say better. How much people were involved in the whole so from project? From Autodesk's side, yeah. we had uh, I think it was seven in total. Um, so a lot of people from Pier Nine, Mickey, uh, some people in France and in London helping out, and then we had like additional support staff like outside of the Autodesk um, fold. Is it fold? Uh, sure, we'll go with Let's that. Let's go with fold, yeah. Okay. Um, all in all, like, people who helped make this thing happen, it was uh, 22. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. Takes a village. <laughs> Takes a village, <laughs> right? Uh, so how, you seem to know a lot about the process. How involved with the design and this whole workflow were you? Uh, completely, because I, I'm the athlete, you know, I have to compete with it. And um, basically, I made the said what kind of requirements I have, um, what I want, what should be better. Um, and basically it was, well, I challenged you a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so it, was, it was like working for a disappointed boss, just like <laughs> constantly. Every, every, every time you had this <laughs> great idea. Did you call idea, me a disappointed said, boss? Yeah, it needs come to be on. <laughs> You'd call him up and be like, this is actually worse than the last time. Yeah, what oh, yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the classic withholding father in a movie. It's just like yeah, <laughs> but I was more involved really the complete uh, process, and that was um, very important because um, otherwise um, you wouldn't have had the pr that product in the end that would perform. Okay, so I'm thinking if I was a high level, I mean, I will be soon in the senior division, but if I was a high performing <laughs> athlete. I would be really focused on training and maybe not want to spend a lot of time on this and be like, hey, you guys are the experts. Go do it and get me what I need. Are, would that be an option, you think? I guess both of you. Do you think that's an option in the future where it will be a little less hands-on for the athlete? So could, could you easily go from the scan to a final product in a much quicker time frame? Or, or does all of those inter intermediate steps need to happen? I think in the meanwhile, we could do it faster with less time on me, but um, 
at that time, you know, we had to understand the whole process and the requirements I have as a cyclist, I have as an amputated person mm -hmm. with a fitting. So that needs a lot of understanding. It's a pilot project, you know, so it took the time. I think meanwhile, we are much faster on that. And, um, and you have to know, I was just saying what I want. They have to do what I want. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that and didn't find solutions. They had to find it. So I was just saying, look, I want this. Um, this is not working. This is not right. This is not. And I want that. So I was just basically being, what, how did you call me? Bossy. Bossy. I think it was a disappointed. Yeah. Disappointed boss. <laughs> Thank you. Constantly. Yeah, I was a disappointed boss. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, I mean, the reason it took us so long the first time was... I'm not a biomechanical engineer or expert and I had to learn all of that on the on the go and I don't speak German and <laughs> Denise's prostitutes don't speak English a tiny so, bit a tiny bit that sounds so, like it could be a problem yeah well she had to try and translate all these technical words and technical language into something I could understand so yeah, that, I that learned was, a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah what was the word for tapping a screw in German again It was a super long word, you know, to make a thread on something. I'm not sure. I'll find it later. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm okay. talking about? Like a tap and die. Yeah. We say tap, it's one syllable. It's like eight in German. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm questioning your knowledge of the German language now. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the German language. I'm a disappointed boss. Okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> this is that's an well amazing morning. <laughs> so I'm uh, old and in a senior division. It's fine. Yeah. So, uh, a part of that Can design, I have an autograph? <laughs> <laughs> a part of that design process was um, you mentioned some aero requirements. Um, how did you guys handle some of that testing? And um, was it more rule of thumb like you knew it had to be a thin you knew it had to be you know kind of a foil shape like what, what went behind some of the arrow shape uh of the prosthetic well we had the first prints and um for sure it was not perfect right from the beginning so we had a lot of arrows and the first print that came looked more like a vase you can put flowers in and <laughs> water but not like a socket that i could use okay. so Um, See where the disappointed boss bit <laughs> comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just honest. <laughs> But, um, you know, it takes that errors to make it, to make it better. Okay. And um, uh, we had, like, already the second print was one I could use. Okay. So imagine that. That's crazy for a total new process. So um, all in all, although I challenged him and said, like, this is not working and I want that different, He was good in doing that because uh, no one else would have been able to. That's a pretty good compliment for yeah. a disappointed boss. Come on. She has her moments. Yeah. She has her moments. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Man, you guys must have spent a lot of time together. You know, actually... Or at least on the phone together on or yeah. something. On the phone and, like, texting. But I yeah. think in person, maybe only, like... Before games, three times, four times? Yeah, four times. That was yeah. it. Yeah. Um, It's not a lot. It wasn't a ton. It was yeah, mostly didn't want the too text. Much, so yeah. Try to you wanted to keep your distance. Yeah. Absolutely. We saw the way I drove and I was smart. I just told him that I've been racing all the time. I didn't, but sometimes. Oh, yeah. Okay. She would tell me she was <laughs> racing and then on Instagram she's just having some coffee at with the beach, friend, laying on the sun. Yeah. What you do I'm as a professional Munich. athlete all the time, you have to get ton that looks like you're in shape. That's what I've been doing wrong. <laughs> yeah. It explains so much. You gotta go to the tanning yeah. salon now. <laughs> right, exactly. I can train you. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to set up something after this so I can get all the tips for my new career. Yeah. So I saw you met with my close personal friend, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> How was his coffee this morning? I uh, didn't met him. Well, I texted him. He hasn't gotten back to me yet. Okay. But, okay. Uh, On a scale of like one to ten, so we know he's like a sports guy, mm -hmm. but how much do you think he understood the technology and design side of things? Because I know like I've had a number of startup friends that have gone to DC mm -hmm. and met with him, and it seems that he's interested in it, but I'm curious about how well it seemed like he understood. You know, on the one hand, I was in a very lucky position. It was the right time and the right president. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not one year later. Right. So I was happy, very happy about that point. <laughs> um, but really honestly, you know, you get all the briefing before and it looked like, okay, we're going to have a Q&A and it's going to be very scripted. But 
when we've been talking, when he came to us, when I was presenting him the prosthetic, um, it was totally different. He really knew about the process. He really understand the benefit and it was a conversation. It was not, he was questioning me anything and I gave an answer and he was questioning the next thing and I gave an answer. It was a conversation and he realized the benefits. And that was impressing to me because he's really into the topic. Mm -hmm. He was really well informed and he did understand the wider perspective and the benefits of the process. So it was not just kind of breathing I get, just doing Q and A. So he, did understand what the process and the whole thing means for the future of making prosthesis. That's impressive to me because in theory, I'm supposed to understand this process and I'm still kind of like, meh. Yeah. He's supposed to be running the country and you feel like he knew what was going on. That yeah, makes me feel that bad. That is amazing. Yeah. 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 It is and amazing. this is really his, you know, he's present when he arrives. He's just present in a very positive way and, uh, and he's really interested in to that. That's great. So question for both of you. Um, so you've been racing for, you said, seven years. H how do you think this technology has affected your performance with your races? And then, and then Paul, I wanted to ask you the, the same question, just the technology in general for just prosthetics and athletics and that sort of stuff. So, f so would you have won without the technology? Well, Paul, it's always you, two you sides. Missed, you just you know? missed Paul. Paul, Paul clearly says it. no. It was all me. She's lazy and does she nothing. She owes me a bronze medal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did she let you touch the bronze medal at least? I take I your picture to, with I got it? to take a picture. He was hanging around it. his neck yeah. Oh. Yeah. a <laughs> lot of times. Well, it's also too heavy. I didn't want it after that. I was like, no, nah, I don't think I could wear this every day. <laughs> Not for sure. Like um, uh, when we did the, the final prosthesis, um, I did test it. You know, it's nice to get a fancy leg and then they say it's super performing, but mm -hmm. I want to double check everything. So um, as a professional athlete, you have to test if it's really good. So what I did, um, we did performance tests on the track and in the velodrome and it was faster. So um, for sure, if you don't have a trained athlete and you just have that perfect fitting prosthesis, but he's not trained, you know, you won't perform either. But the combination of a well-trained athlete that's perfectly prepared for the games and a perfect prosthesis makes the point. And um, I saved uh, in the testings like almost two seconds at it three kilometers. Like a lot when it comes to yeah. like hundredth of a second uh, in sight. It is. It is. Well, outside um, uh, at a time trial and road race, it's not one hundred of seconds just in a sprint, um, but um, it is a lot, and it does make a change if it's maybe the fourth place or the third place or the third place or the second place. Mm -hmm. So it does make a change. And then Paul, uh, same question for you. Um, you said you weren't a biomechanical engineer prior to this, but what you've learned so far and working with Denise, how do you think the future of this is going to change? Um, not only just athletes, but just people in general that are gonna leverage this technology um, moving forward. Yeah, I think it's, um, we've seen a paradigm shift happening. Like we, in that, for that industry, like it, it's happening right now. And um, I think the more time goes on, the more that process is gonna, gonna become necessary. Um, like Denise's prosthetist, he's in his 60s. Um, and Thomas, his son is in his late 30s, yeah. early 40s, right? Um, <clears throat> but, if you take the UK as an example for the rest of the world, you have um, just over 100 registered prosthetists and orthotists and 100,000 patients. And the pro so seems like a pretty bad ratio. Right? It's not great. Um, and the number of students you have going into biomechanical design is going down as well. So the only way that you're going to be able to support the number of patients when you don't have the experts is digitizing that process and scaling up. Um, it's also just like, yeah, for, for Denise, of course, like getting the prosthetic fast is important because she needs to train with it. But the same applies to regular patients too. Like if I needed a prosthetic and I have to wait 10 weeks, and if I started a diet the day after I met with the prosthetist, or I just decided I was going to eat burgers for the rest of my life, like mm. that prosthetic's not going to fit when I get it. And that's a major problem. And it's a reoccurring problem too. So 
it's happening. Like there's tons of really cool companies that have started adopting this technology and the and this process to make prosthetics as well. Okay. You mentioned on stage shoes are kind of a problem, and I keep checking yours out here. How many pairs of shoes do you have? <clears throat> I I feel like it's going to be a I lot. Might have you beat Denise. <laughs> Uh, Paul could be me. I think like 30, 40 pairs. Seems like Is a lot. Is that still okay? No, I mean, that's. But most of them fine. are really like training shoes. Most like. Yeah, half. Three pairs or. No, no, like no, half? no, no. Half of it. That's pretty good. Yeah. Luke, do you have any other technical questions? I only have one other that I wanted to follow up with. No, I'm good. You're good? All right. So the last one, and Hooper kind of stole my thunder on this one on main stage, but that's fine. I won't hold it against him. <laughs> How could people, and I'm going to be fired after this, so that's cool. <laughs> How could people work with you or even with us, like with the Autodesk Foundation, to help children in need of prosthetics or, or really anyone like you were talking about? Thoughts? Just oh, I'm taking e this email, one? Oh, email okay. Paul. This one and I'm completing. Paul.sohi at autodesk.com to get involved. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do that? No one's listening. Me? It's fine. Okay, great. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, the Autodesk Foundation has supported a number of uh, companies doing this. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to say that we're responsible, but definitely in the last three years, we've seen like a lot of companies start to, startups in particular, um, adopt this technology in this process. So um, I've been training anyone who's interested in listening to me or asks for it to, to do this digital process. And I think once we get to a decent enough groundswell and demand, we'll make like a full um, documentation and just share it out with the industry and just go, hey, we think we figured out a way to do this. You wanna try it out and see how it works. Now, I actually do have one more question. Of course you do. Uh, do you think that it will get to the point where you can go directly from a 3D print to something wearable. Yeah, we, we did that already. No, no, I was I, going I, to say, isn't that so, what just happened? So <laughs> no, no post-process, no smoothing, no, oh, no, no carbon no. overlay. Is, is, there, is there anything on the horizon material-wise yeah. where you could go from, it comes out of the printer and it, it, it goes on? I think for prosthetics, no. no, but for other industries, yeah. There's this really cool um, 3D printing company uh, out there called XJet. And um, I don't fully understand, I'm not gonna pretend to understand how their printing technology works. As far as I'm concerned, it's magic. Um, but they have a way of actually just like um, atomically bonding the metal in the printing process. So there's no lasers used and none of that. Um, and the parts that come out, they look like they've been machined. It's just insane. Again, as far as I'm concerned, it's magic. But yeah, maybe for plastics one day. I can see that happening. Okay. We got a maybe. We got a flat out no over here from the, <laughs> from the disappointed boss. So that's cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we kind of ran over already. So I think we should wrap this up. But Denise, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully this was one of the less painful interviews you've had to do with us. <laughs> and I will follow up with you on some of the training tips that I need. Yeah, and I need an autograph in Ab advance. Absolutely. <laughs> Just before, secure. Before he was famous. Yeah. You can sell <laughs> it on eBay. Absolutely. <laughs> Preparing your Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to have one soon. All right. Well, thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of Accelerate 2018. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, guys. See you. Thanks, guys.